campus was quite different from what it is today. Sheridan Road was lined with gorgeous elm trees. And during the summer, they would make an umbrella right over the road, like driving through a tunnel of greenery. There wasn't any filling in of the lake. Deering was new. Tech was new. It was so beautiful when I was there. It's fantasy land now. History is a series of sharply defined images, mental snapshots of people, places, and events that evoke moments in time. For 150 years, Northwestern has provided these images to hundreds of thousands of students, particularly on occasions like this one, graduation. Your love affair with Northwestern starts when you graduate. You're imbued with the spirit of Northwestern while you're here, but you don't realize it because you're so young and so busy. And as, the further you get away from your alma mater, the more you love it. to come here and the first day that I came here it was a beautiful sunny fall day all the trees were changing colors on the lake fill and it was just so perfect that I couldn't resist I had to come here the beautiful setting is what attracted Northwestern's founders as well they had already made a decision to build outside Chicago so that the university would have room to grow one of the founders of the university a fellow by the name of Orrington Lent came up the old Ridge Road, which is today's Ridge Avenue in Evanston, and, uh, he saw the sun sparkling off Lake Michigan through a beautiful oak grove and decided that this is the place. And that became the uh, home of uh, the university. 150 years later, oak trees still stand on the Northwestern campus. And there are many other reminders of the past that evoke feelings of nostalgia and tradition. One of my favorite places on campus is the Shakespeare Garden, which I think every person who discovers it feels that they're the first and only ever to discover it. And it's a place after my own heart because it's sort of literary. It has the quotes from Shakespeare, but it also is this beautiful little private, very romantic little spot, actually. The happiest memories for me on this campus would be at Deering Library, which is where Joe and I used to court. That was the word, days, yeah. yeah. I just love the ambiance, I love the feeling. I love the architecture. I love the books. Deering Meadow was the greatest place. That's where you gathered on the steps. And you could sit there and sun and the grass was beautiful there. Then of course, there's the rock. I remember The Rock. In fact, I met Warren Beatty at a fundraiser, and I said I had gone to Northwestern. And so he wrote Remember The Rock on the little autograph he gave me. So even Warren Beatty remembers The Rock. Before there was a rock, there was a tree, where students in the late 1800s used to gather. It was a landmark of sorts on a campus that at the time had only two main structures. The first one, built in 1855 and later dubbed Old College, and University Hall, which had been completed in 1869. In the decades that followed, more buildings were added, altering the face of Northwestern's landscape. But the most dramatic change came in the 1960s, when the campus itself took on a whole new shape. Northwestern needed property to expand. So plans were made to extend 1,200 feet into the lake from the existing shoreline and create nearly 80 acres of new land. 
I had second thoughts about it, purely from the standpoint they were taking away the beach that was right out here and the rocks that were right out here, and they were changing the landscape. The edge of the campus was basically a bluff, and as you looked over, it was a fair distance, about 12 to 15 feet down to the water. It was an ambitious and some thought impossible idea, but construction of the new property was soon underway. The project took two and a half years to complete. I have to confess, I don't recall paying much attention to what was going on out there. Uh, I just knew what was going on. And uh, at some point I looked up and it was a big mud flat. And by the time I left, I think they had built the observatory, which it really dates you when you've seen a building built and you've seen it torn down, <laughs> which has been my experience with the observatory. Gradually, more buildings were added to the lake fill, including in 1970, a new library to augment the badly overcrowded Deering. But more than any of its buildings, it's the setting itself that makes Northwestern distinctive. If you go out there in the summertime, it's really gorgeous. This is an open vista of waves and sands and it's a great place to study in the afternoons. It's just glorious. I wish we were romancing now. It'd be a great place to go for strolls. Northwestern got its start back in 1850, when nine Methodists gathered in a law office above a hardware store in Chicago. Their plan was to create a university for students from Illinois and nearby states that made up the area once known as the Northwest Territory. But it was some time before the idea became a reality. They got their charter in 1851. They purchased the property in 1853-54. And then they built a small three-story frame structure and opened it in November of 1855 for the first classes. There were eight students and three professors uh, present. So it was a very modest beginning. Although more would arrive later, there were only 10 graduates in the first class of 1859. New students trickled in, some from as far as England and Canada. Then in 1869, Northwestern became co-ed, one of the first major universities to do so, and nearly a century ahead of its Ivy League peers. Over the years, the school and the student body grew exponentially. Today, nearly 8,000 undergraduates attend Northwestern. And they come from all over the United States, as well as around the world. And the character of the student body has changed as well. I am so pleased to see the ethnicity that is so visible here. When I was a student here, I was not really received well as a black student. Couldn't live in the dormitories and there was no social life particularly to be involved in. It wasn't a shock, it was just a continuation of the kinds of experiences I had had in, at home in Dayton because it was the way things were at that time. But many students, as well as some in the administration, weren't willing to accept things as they were. During that time, the Daily Northwestern wrote several editorials about the situation while clubs such as the Quibblers were created to address various forms of discrimination. I also remember that in my sorority we had a clause against Asian students and we wanted to pledge a young woman. And we actually stood up to our national and said, if, if you don't change this, we're going to become a local chapter. We're not going to stay with the national. And eventually, they did prove successful. In my junior year, they opened what they called an international house, which was sort of a catch-all for everyone who was <laughs> not of the dominant group, you know. So there were uh, graduate students and any of us who were ethnic, who couldn't live in other dormitories, lived there. And it was a pleasant experience. But the university quickly recognized that wasn't enough. Jack Hines and Bill Eilenfeld set forth an aggressive plan to recruit minority students to the campus. And minority students in the 60s essentially meant black students. And we had very quickly about 150 to 200 minority students on campus who found themselves in an environment that was extraordinarily different. 
and they were unprepared for Northwestern, we were unprepared for them. And that led in the spring of 1968 to a sit-in at the Bursar's office, organized by members of the Black Student Group for members only. There was a whole list of demands, including having a Black Studies Department, having increased enrollment of African Americans, a Black dorm, and on and on and on. Ultimately, most of their demands were met. That's when Northwestern began the policy of need-blind admissions and need-based financial aid. And it had an immediate effect in transforming the student body. And this is not just minorities. These are people whose parents have worked in factories and they've come here largely through financial aid provided by the university. The overall diversity within the community has increased considerably. I think the education is better now as a consequence. In the beginning, Northwestern offered courses in the classics, literature, science, and the arts, a fairly standard curriculum for the time. But over the years, the university grew to include a number of undergraduate and professional schools for both traditional and adult students. While the growth definitely added luster to Northwestern's academic standing, it also created a rite of passage that every student since then has had to endure. The university has modernized its methods for handling increased enrollments at registration. There were so many choices. I was taking science, I was taking French. I had a great Irish literature class, had never read a piece of Irish literature. It was a wonderful time for all of us because it was a very safe place to fail. At Northwestern, I tried everything. I tried the journalism, I tried photography, economics, you know, you took all the courses. So we learned a very good span of material. That range of academic offerings began as early as 1878, when Robert Cumnock, a popular teacher of elocution, convinced the university to expand his course into a full two-year program. The School of Oratory, as it was then called, was so popular the university soon needed a new building to accommodate all of the students. So in 1895, Annie Mae Swift Hall was built. The program itself grew to the point where it became known as the School of Speech, with a curriculum offering everything from the study of speech disorders. Audiology students do many experiments with their own classmates. To theater. Oh, sir, I can't read. Radio. TV and film. The next school to evolve from the liberal arts program can be traced to 1873, when Northwestern merged with the Evanston College for Ladies. That not only brought in new students, but music classes as well. By 1895, under the direction of Peter Lutkin, the courses had been restructured into a multifaceted program that included a glee club, an a cappella choir, and a symphony orchestra. And as the School of Music expanded, so did its presence on campus. The whole Pickstager complex is absolutely gorgeous, state of the art. Some of the most exciting things that happened were the concerts of my music. Because as a young composer, you sit and you write a symphony, and then they're performing at a Pickstager concert hall. I mean, that's amazing. In 1908, the School of Commerce was created to provide courses in business. Classes were held on the Evanston campus and later in Weebolt Hall on the Chicago campus. Eventually, it ended its undergraduate program and changed its name to the Kellogg Graduate School of Management. It soon earned a reputation as one of the top business schools in the nation. The School of Education, which for many years was housed in the old college building, was initially geared toward preparing teachers. Now located in Annenberg Hall, it too has evolved to include courses in counseling psychology and social policy. The School of Engineering came out of the science program, helped along by a wealthy donor, who felt that there was great need for a more specialized curriculum. Part of his gift resulted in building the Technological Institute, a giant maze of classrooms, lecture halls, and laboratories that have been confounding students since it opened in 1942. The Medill School of Journalism didn't evolve from the university's liberal arts program. 
Instead, it resulted from an idea brought to Northwestern by a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, whose publisher eventually provided some of the funding. In the 1950s, the school moved to Fisk Hall, one of the oldest buildings on campus, built in 1899 for the prep school that Northwestern ran for many years. I think that there was sort of a fondness for that decrepit look and feel because it was sort of that old newspaper, old time journalism kind of feel. In the 1930s, Northwestern created a program for adults attending classes part-time, which grew to become the School for Continuing Studies. But long before that, the university became affiliated with a number of professional schools. Initially, there were four. Chicago Medical College, Union College of Law, Illinois College of Pharmacy, College of Dental and Oral Surgery. Prior to the arrival in 1900 of Henry Wade Rogers, who was one of the most significant and superb presidents in Northwestern's history, the various professional schools in Chicago were pretty much laws unto themselves. He brought these various professional schools, medical, law, dental school, really into the university as integral components of the university. But the story then picks up really 20 years later, and there you had the physical consolidation of the Northwestern schools in Chicago, uh, by uh, another great president of the University, Walter Dill Scott. He recognized that you couldn't have the university located in disparate locations. So Northwestern purchased the land and built a brand new campus on Chicago Avenue. And all of the schools were brought there and consolidated there. It further enhanced the reputation of what had always been regarded as some of the top professional programs in the nation. Historically, the strength of Northwestern has been in its professional schools very strong law school, very strong and with growing strength medical school. Obviously Kellogg is one of the best schools in the country, a world-renowned business and management school. So you have a set of very strong professional schools that make an impact both locally in Chicago, regionally, nationally and internationally. Northwestern's reputation for academic excellence at all levels is also due in great part to its faculty. The fact that we did have access to most of the stars of the Northwestern faculty at the time was the highlight of my undergraduate years. Melville Herskovitz, the anthropologist who is of course an African expert, he was certainly a hero of mine. Uh, he was just an incredible human being, an incredible teacher. He talked about, if you will, the sophistication of a number of the African societies that he had spent time studying. And in effect, what he was saying was, your idea that these are all savages from the dark continent, you better get over because that is simply not true. And it was, uh, I think, I can still feel some emotion about uh, just that one session. These are people that didn't just teach you, but they lived their lives in a way where they communicated their beliefs to the students, and they were doing things to change the world for the better. And that's incredible. I, I feel so lucky to have uh, learned from such amazing people. For the first few years, the university's focus was solely on academics, and the only activities that were offered reflected that, literary societies and debate. But by the turn of the century, there were many more clubs reflecting a variety of interests, as well as special events like the Northwestern Circus, which began in 1908 and became an annual celebration until it eventually grew too big for the university to handle. Homecoming was established in 1911 as an activity solely centered around returning alums. There was a parade, but definitely not as elaborate as the ones in later years. Then through downtown Evanston and eventually back to the campus, the homecoming parade makes its triumphal tour. Other celebrations seem to be tied to the seasons. For years, a May Day celebration was held on Deering Meadow. That was the day they uh, issued all of the awards, the end blankets and all of that. May Court was very important. And there were various women selected who, as I recall, wore flowers. And it was a, a beautiful day on Deering Meadow. You know, they have the song, Northwestern Forward's Pretty Girls. 
Well, they were right. My sister Ronnie was like a sophomore queen. She went to school with me there too. And she was a Chi Omega. So it was all lovely and people kept falling in love and they would get pinned. There was pins in those days. There's a lot of major organizations that people are still involved in that kind of bring our campus together. Dance Marathon, DM, is one of the largest student-run philanthropies in the nation. You could find any group of people and you could sort of immerse yourself in any culture. You know, I did everything from cheerleading one year to doing theater on campus. And I didn't even scratch the surface of what I probably could have availed myself of here. I come back and talk to undergraduates and I tell them, you know, check out the lectures. They get incredible people that come to speak here. I probably have to confess that I love the Daily Northwestern more than the classes. Not that the university edu education was uh, in any sense lacking, it was wonderful. But the experience of actually being responsible for real journalism. I'm doing a story on an SAFB bill that you might be interested in. Even if it was college journalism, and putting out a newspaper was quite a good experience. It's curtain time for the WAMU Show. We love the yeah. WAMU Show. Student produced musical comedy. We know everybody in it, so it was our friends performing. It's great. Talent is the one requirement for participation in the show. WAMU stood for the Women's Athletic Association and the Men's Union, two separate groups that had been putting on their own musical shows until they combined their efforts in 1932. These kids not only acted and performed, but they wrote the music. They did the costumes, they did the lighting. It was a, it, it was marvelous. And of course, all those people went on to, many of them went on to careers. Engine boy gets all dressed up to find a wife. We kiss all the girls. If they're slender, tall, or short, When I was here was the first years, I think it was the second year of the Meow Show, which was the improv group which produced a lot of people who went on to Saturday Night Live or Julie Louis-Dreyfus I knew. Still other notables appeared in university theater productions. Then, of course, there's the Northwestern Marching Band, which began in the early 1900s and has been a fixture on campus ever since. During the football season, we would uh, conduct pep rallies, we would do parades in downtown Evanston. Not to mention halftime festivities. These are stars of Gridiron 2, 160 Northwestern bandsmen who look good and sound good. The band was such a popular feature at the football games that in 1975, for homecoming, someone came up with the idea of having past members return to play. The start of a popular tradition. And now we present the Numbalums. The Numbalums now appears three times each homecoming, before the game, at halftime, and after the game. Win or lose, we. We, we celebrate. Go Caps! Talk turns to the homecoming weekend. Over the years, a number of activities have come to be associated with homecoming, all of which have helped to make football one of the best known sports on campus, but certainly not the only one. But if you took the entire range of sports, including women's sports, 
Uh, Northwestern rates very, very well. We've had Olympic champions in swimming. We've had Olympic champions in wrestling. We've had some great golf teams here. The years that I played tennis here at Northwestern, we did win the Big Tens, and there were a lot of teams on the women's programs here that were ranked uh, pretty high in the nation, and I think it's only gotten better. In the early years, Northwestern's teams were known as the Fighting Methodists in honor of the school's founders. Then in 1924, a sports writer reported that the football team fought like wildcats. The nickname stuck. Willie, who would become mascot in 1933, didn't make his first live appearance until 1947. But it was good timing, because it was the year before one of the greatest seasons in Northwestern football history, when the Wildcats finally went to the Rose Bowl. That fall of 1948, there was a 24-hour celebration on campus. Every student who could afford it followed the team to Pasadena, where they watched Northwestern beat the University of California in the final minute of the game. It was a play that we practiced all year. I was to snap the ball between my right leg and the quarterback's right leg to the right halfback who was lined up here. Frank Ashenbrenner, who was the left halfback, would go in motion to the right so that when the ball was snapped, the left defensive end could not see the ball coming to Tunnicliffe. And so we were very, very fortunate that the play worked perfectly, and Eddie Tunnicliffe was able to go to 45 yards for the touchdown and won the ball game for us. I said, look at this. This is a sports school. I love this sports school. I got there. That was the end of it. Good night, everybody. We won in 48, 49. We're going to wait a while. Hope was renewed a few years later when Era Parsegian took over as coach, recruiting some of the top high school players in the country, like All-American Ron Burton. Air Parsegan had a dream, and his dream was to stop Ohio State, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, and, and Michigan. And Air Parsegan talked me into being part of his dream. He turned it around. We came within one or two plays of going to the Rose Bowl. But that was as close as they'd get for nearly half a century. These new roommates are off to a good start as the conversation gets around to an interest they share in common. In the South Quadrangles, freshman women get acquainted here in the lounge of Shepherd Hall. When Northwestern started, there were no dorms. Men either lived in rooming houses or boarded with families throughout Evanston. Female students had it a little better. They were given rooms on the top floor of the former Evanston College for Ladies, which had become part of Northwestern after the two institutions merged. By then, the building had been renamed in honor of the college's former president, Francis Willard, who also became Northwestern's first dean of women. Men had to wait until 1914, when the university built housing for them at the other end of campus. Known as the North Quads, it contained four dorms for men and seven fraternities. Then in 1927, 14 sororities and three more dorms for women were built on the south end of campus, the South Quads. For a while, that seemed enough to accommodate the growing number of students attending Northwestern. But then something happened to change housing conditions and campus life in general, World War II. Beginning with the Civil War, many students at Northwestern actively supported the country's war efforts. World War II was probably the most extensive involvement of Northwestern students in the war. Both campuses, the Chicago campus and the Evanston campus, were used for naval training programs. On the Chicago campus, one of the people who was trained to become an officer was future President John F. Kennedy. As thousands of officer candidates, radio men, and pilots attended classes and training sessions, Northwestern became known as the Annapolis of the Midwest. Meanwhile, with so many extra students, housing was at a premium. 
which got even worse after the war with vets returning to college on the GI Bill. When I came to Northwestern in 44, I was not allowed to live on campus because I was a city girl and they needed the space for the, uh, for the military men. So they would only accept me if I would promise I wouldn't apply for housing which I didn't. The initial place that I lived is now the site of, of Leverone Hall, the Graduate School of Management, and that was known as Lunt Huts. And Lunt Huts were uh, a series of Quonset huts that had been built for the war that housed eight students each, two to a room and one set of toilets. After World War II, student life returned to normal. For many, that meant spending time at Scott Hall, which was built in 1940, thanks in part to students who helped raise money by selling sandwiches, otherwise known as Scott Witches. The completed building housed Khan Auditorium, offices for the syllabus and the humor magazine Purple Parrot, and game rooms and lounges. But the most popular place was the grill. Part of the attraction was the food, which was considered far better than what was served at the dorm. Good food is one of the things you look for when you're living away from home. Today, many students prefer to eat at Norris Center, the student union that replaced Scott Hall in 1972. Back in those days, we didn't have the kind of facilities that exist now at Norris. There wasn't a cafeteria like there is now, but it was a good place to sit. The place I probably spent the most time at Northwestern was at the library, which was not my favorite place, but necessary. The time I went to Northwestern, that was the social hot spot. That was where you did your work, and that was where you met people, that was where you made friends. I spent hours in the library. It was not unusual to close the place up <laughs> at one or two o'clock in the morning. That aspect of student life hasn't changed much over the years, nor has the weather in Evanston. I mean, I remember going to class and the wind is blowing and the snow is coming down and my pants leg used to be like uh, pads, they freeze. Spring is a special Northwestern welcome as hundreds of purple and white crocuses unfurl the school colors along campus walks. Never in any other place have I enjoyed spring more than I enjoyed it at Northwestern. It was one big party and celebration. Of course, there have been some changes in student life, as alums are quick to point out. Oh, <laughs> when, I, when I was here, uh, there were rules and regulations. We had to be in a certain time during the week, 2 o'clock on Saturday and Friday nights. If you got late minutes, you had to make that up the next weekend by not going out. Historically, the administration has been very protective of students' morals, especially the women. An 1866 list of regulations banned smoking, drinking, profane language, and noise or any irregular conduct tending to disturb the peace of the community. Students then weren't any happier about it than they would be now. As early as 1900, female residents were attempting to beat their 10 p.m. curfew by climbing walls and crawling into windows. But this, after all, was a university formed by people with a very strong moral code. In fact, one of its founders, Grant Goodrich, was actively involved in the first temperance society of Chicago. He successfully lobbied the Illinois legislature to amend Northwestern's charter to prohibit the manufacture or sale of spiritus, vinous, or fermented liquors within four miles of the location of said university. In other words, You couldn't drink, Evanston was dry. It was hopelessly, aridly dry and uh, the only place where there were bars and therefore any sort of entertainment night uh, was either way, way, way out in, I don't know, Skokie or beyond, or on Howard Street, which was a dividing line between Evanston and uh, Chicago. We used to call that South Campus. But of all the changes in student life, some of the most significant center on the dorms. There were no telephones. There was a payphone on one floor. Um, there was a, a television set for the whole dorm. It was a different world. Uh, men were allowed in only on the first floor, and uh, I think there were certain hours of the day when they could come. 
you know, in those days, Willard Hall was where the girls was, but you couldn't go in there. There was no co-ed jumping around. There was a lady with a kind of a husky lady with a little mustache, and she would say, you kid, come in here, it's after hours, go away. So you would just kiss your date goodnight there in that little courtyard of Willard Hall. We went within the space of about two years from single sex housing with hours for women, as times at which women had to be in the dorms, to limited parietal hours, defined periods of time when people from the opposite sex could come to visit, to dorms that were almost completely co-ed. That happened very quickly. It happened between about 67 and 69, if I remember right. But it really made just a huge difference in the life of the campus. But that was part of the social changes and the dynamics that were happening. It yeah. moved very fast. We went from white gloves to bra burning in about two and a half years. Oh, it, it was really a very fabulous place to be in terms of the fervor that was going on around race, also around gender. I went to my first women's studies event and also anti-war activity. The Vietnam War really did change this campus as it did many other campuses. Students started to see that uh, the actions of the national government would really affect them. The real high point of activism here was in the spring of 1970 after uh, the invasion of Cambodia and the deaths of the students at Kent State. I surely remember, as I think anybody would who was there, the experience of being part of 5,000 students that massed out on Deering Meadow. And that's when the university closed for about four or five days and people went out and lobbied and leafleted uh, against the war. I think Northwestern probably is one of the few places that people use their registration cards to vote to shut the university. And it was very orderly and I think if you talk to people who were there, there's a very good feeling about those days. It was rather remarkable. Northwestern allowed us to do what we had to do, and that's one of the things I'm very proud of about my association with Northwestern. What more can you ask for? Big Ten sports. You got Chicago really close by. Beautiful campus. Access to the lake. Facilities that are comparable to any place you're ever going to find. I can't imagine getting the same experience out of any other school. It offered everything I hoped it would and more. When you were watching CNN and all of a sudden it comes a professor from Northwestern University, or you're reading the Times and it says such scientists from Northwestern University has discovered this, or um, actor or whatnot or musician. I, th I think it's great. I feel really, really proud. I mean, for example, in the first sentence of my bio, which is two pages long, I, I list Northwestern. In my class at journalism school, there were four Pulitzer Prize winners. They were my classmates. It's a great institution that has uh, a unique history uh, and a sense of integrity and ethic about it. For a university that's been around for now a century and a half, and uniquely amongst a wide range of institutions, uh, will have perpetual life. Effa. Remember, is that what you're going to say back there too? Yeah. Effa? Okay, I'll find that. You know, a hundred years from now, IBM might be owned by Home Depot, uh, but they'll still be uh, a Northwestern. We have been here a long time, but I think we'll be here a much longer time. Northwestern University has conferred upon you the degree for which you have been recommended. To this degree, I do now admit you, and I welcome you to the Fellowship of Scholars. I'm the 15th president, and there will be dozens and dozens more after me. I'd like to think that the decisions that I take uh, are really informed by a sense that Northwestern is here for the very long run that I'm in the line of many who came before me. Please rise. That's 
like the best time in a lot of our lives, and I think that's what keeps the school strong, and people feel loyal to it, and they have a great time. They don't only just learn a lot, but they meet friends that they keep for the rest of their lives, and you don't forget that. Everything good that's happened to me since I graduated has some connection to Northwestern. It changed me, it transformed me. I probably wouldn't be sitting in this room running a major civil rights organization had I not gone to Northwestern. It took a poor immigrant Armenian, okay, and took him from the steel mill area and made a man out of him, and for that I love this university. my personal case, uh, it has opened me to opportunities I never would have had. It has uh, introduced me to my wife, to my partner, to a career. I mean, what more could I ask from a university? Hands off the halfback, Ron Burton. He's I don't know if it gets better than this. In fact, I don't think it can. But I'm going to tell you something. The grass is greener at Northwestern. It's hard to describe the actual feeling, but it, it's, it sort of swells up inside you and, and uh, it pervades every part of you and, and, and you're so proud. I think the blood really turns purple inside all of us. You do get teary when you sing uh, all of that. Uh, and the fact that my kids are a part of it, it's very emotional to me. Three kids, a son-in-law and a sister. Uh, and, you know, a couple of best friends to this day, that's a pretty good track record to come out of a, a little place in the Midwest with nice trees. <laughs>